Today, I wanna to go over some updated guidelines for you guys that just came out this month, as well as a whole slew of other interesting literature that I thought it'd be fun to take a look at. So if you go to the Journal Watch page, you'll see that there is this new AABB guideline for blood transfusion in acute MI. Basically, it talks about how the restrictive red blood cell transfusion strategy with the hemoglobin cutoff of less than seven grams per deciliter has kind of been our standard of care, but this recent MINT trial has suggested that there may be a benefit from a more liberal transfusion strategy, for example, with a hemoglobin cutoff of less than 10 grams per deciliter. I actually talked about this trial in my 2024 updates in hospital medicine lecture, but uh, you can see here some of the kind of benefits and the mortality benefits. So there was actually no significant difference in the primary outcome, myocardial infarction or death at 30 days although you can see that there was a trend towards improvement and then you can see the different hemoglobin cutoffs and really that biggest benefit really seemed to be seen at a hemoglobin target of nine because you can see the death at 30 days was 14 percent if less than seven grams per deciliter 11.3 uh, if less than eight and then at that nine uh, grams per deciliter mark that's when you saw that steepest drop in the mortality. So they also reviewed the, the literature here, and they also showed that the liberal transfusion strategy did have significantly higher risk for serious adverse events, defined as anaphylaxis, transfusion-related lung injury, and circulatory overload. However, based on the trend towards improved mortality, they actually did make an official recommendation for a hemoglobin transfusion threshold of less than 10 grams per deciliter in hospitalized patients with acute MI. And this is actually consistent with recent guidelines from other organiz organizations, including the American College of uh, Cardiology. So if you take a look at the 2025 ACC AHA guidelines for the management of acute coronary syndrome, you can see here management of anemia in acute coronary syndrome. They also recommend blood transfusion to achieve a hemoglobin level of greater than 10 grams per deciliter. So now we've got multiple organizations, including the ACC AHA, which I've used multiple times and I've referenced multiple times in my videos, that are suggesting that we should transfuse these patients to greater than 10. So this is one of those things that I would just kind of make a quick Anki card about, just so I know about it. So uh, basically, do recent guidelines now recommend transfusing for a goal hemoglobin greater than 10 in patients with acute MI? And the answer would be yes. We can say that it was recommended in the 2025 ACC AHA and AABB guidelines per results from the MINT trial. And this is just an easy way for me to remember this in the future so I know kind of what the recommendation was and who made that, what the evidence was based on. So here is a, another guideline update from the IDSA, and this is on managing complicated urinary tract infections. And I feel like this is a kind of topic of contention for a lot of people because the guidelines are constantly changing or the definitions of what is a complicated and non-complicated UTI seems like over the years it's just like changed all the time. So apparently their last official guidelines were back in 2010 and uh, they finally are updating it, which is really great. So now this is kind of how UpToDate was treating it in the past, which is that uncomplicated UTIs are those confined to the bladder in afebrile people, and complicated UTIs are infections beyond the bladder, including pyelonephritis, febrile or bacteremic UTIs, and catheter-associated UTIs. Finally, they've updated their terminology because for a very long time, people were saying, well, men, you know, because they're a male, it's automatically a complicated UTI. But for a long time, we have actually not been, uh, you know, treating it like this. So you can see the old complications here, uncomplicated UTI was only in women. All other UTIs were complicated. So if they're a male, it's like complicated automatically, but that's not how we clinically practice. So now the guidelines are up to date with how we practice. What I also like about here is that they confirm the total duration of antibiotic therapy for complicated UTI. And so it should be five to seven days for fluoroquinolone or seven days for non-fluoroquinolones. And this includes patients with associated gram-negative bacteremia. So these are some things that I had addressed in my uh, UTI talk. So you can see here I had UTI and then I had written that fluoroquinolones can be used for five to seven days. And then other antibiotics, generally seven to 10 days, although now they're saying that seven days is sufficient. And I also had a part on uh, bacteremia, which stated that you do not need to extend the duration of antibiotics if somebody has concomitant bacteremia. But now uh, there's also the BALANCE trial, which has basically showed a non-inferiority to treating 
uh, gram-negative bacteremia with a seven-day course of antibiotics versus the 14-day course. And so uh, that would be something I'd probably add here is that per the BALANCE trial, you know, a seven-day course of antibiotics is pretty much uh, sufficient to treat patients with gram-negative bacteremia and UTI. I just really appreciate having the updated IDSA guidelines because you can see here, this was a talk that uh, we had done for the residents and it was just so complicated. You're separating male and female, complex UTI, uncomplex pyelonephritis, complex pyelonephritis. So it just got really, really difficult to know the correct durations. So now it's just very simple. Is it confined to just the bladder or is it extending past the bladder? So I actually did this talk with an ID physician and you can see there actually are still recommendations for doing a prolonged duration of antibiotics. The one that really comes to mind for me is a renal transplant recipient. If you go on up to date, you'll see that they recommend at least 14 to 21 days of treatment and using a very broad spectrum antibiotic with pseudomonal coverage, such as cefepime or uh, zosin. Uh, so there are still situations that you do want to do longer than the five to seven days that their updated guidelines are recommending. So some caveats to the IDSA recommendations is that most studies supporting the recommendation for five to seven days excluded patients with indwelling urinary catheters, severe sepsis, immunocompromising conditions, abscesses in the urinary tract, chronic kidney disease, bacterial prostatitis, complete urinary obstruction, or undergoing urologic procedures. Uh, and then they also specifically state that men with a febrile UTI in which acute bacterial prostatitis is suspected may benefit from a longer treatment duration, for example, 10 to 14 days. So again, broadly speaking, complicated UTI, five to seven days of fluoroquinolones versus a non-fluoroquinolone antibiotic. And this holds true even if they have bacteremia, but there are still some situations that you may be wanting to extend the antibiotic duration further. So next is some updates on managing community acquired pneumonia. So the last time we had the uh, guidelines was the 2019 IDSA and ATS guidelines. So this current update has been published solely by the American Thoracic uh, Society, although IDSA contributed significantly to its development. So key new developments, including growing use of point of care ultrasound, enhanced availability of rapid molecular tests for a wide range of pathogens, evidence supporting shorter antibiotic courses and new data on steroids for treating patients with severe pneumonia. So all of the literature that we had kind of covered in that updates in hospital medicine uh, lecture are basically are basically starting to come to fruition right now. And so that trial that, of course, we're referring to is the Cape Cod trial, which showed the benefit of steroids in severe community acquired pneumonia. So some of the key points is that lung ultrasound is an acceptable diagnostic alternative to chest X-ray for diagnosing CAP if clinicians are trained in its use. Uh, and this one was actually a really big one for me. So if patients with CAP and a positive respiratory viral panel, the writers make the following antibiotic recommendations. So outpatients without comorbidities, no antibiotics. Outpatients with comorbidities, antibiotics are suggested. And inpatients, antibiotics are suggested for all patients regardless of CAP severity. So this is actually going to be practice changing for me because... Typically, when I had somebody who was coming in and it seemed like they had some kind of uh, respiratory tract infection, like suspicious for community-acquired pneumonia, we'd start them on ceftriaxone and azithromycin, and then all of a sudden, respiratory viral panel comes back and is positive. A lot of times, we would de-escalate the antibiotic therapy because we're like, well, they have an alternative explanation for their symptoms. But now, I think it's imperative that, you know, this really makes sense that if somebody's being admitted to the hospital for a pneumonia, even if their respiratory viral panel comes back positive, positive, you should continue their antibiotics just because they're sick enough to be admitted to the hospital. Really, it still warrants coverage. So should you continue antibiotics in a patient admitted for pneumonia and found to have a positive respiratory viral panel? Yes, per 2025 updated ATS guidelines. Also should give to outpatients with comorbidities. Antibiotics not needed if outpatient without comorbidities. Antibiotic durations do seem to be a little bit shorter than before, so three to four days, whereas typically we would do like a five to seven day course is kind of the standard uh, amount of antibiotics we do. And then, of course, for systemic steroids, if anybody has severe CAP, then steroids are suggested unless they have concurrent influenza. All right, now moving on to some more interesting literature. So how close is AI getting to replacing physicians? Large language models and clinical reasoning, the frontier in 2025. So researchers from Google have conducted two landmark studies that define the abilities of large language models in more complex clinical reasoning. 
So in one report, the investigators presented 300 New England Journal of Medicine clinical pathologic conference cases to their LLM model called Articulate Medical Intelligence Explorer, or AMI. And then they also presented it to board-certified clinicians. So AMI outperformed unassisted physicians in listing the correct diagnosis in the differential, 59% versus 34%, and in ranking the correct diagnosis first, 29% versus 16%. And when those same physicians revised their lists with Amy's help, their diagnostic accuracy increased. And so hopefully that's showing that AI will be kind of like this adjunctive tool rather than solely replacing doctors. But I am curious to hear when you think AI will reach that level of fully replacing physicians. You know, the way that it's developing so far, it is really you know, quite striking how fast it's developing. And so part of me feels like, you know, within 20 years, it may really be able to replace physicians, but who knows? So in another study, the focus shifted from case vignettes to live conversations. Patient actors completed two text-based consultations via a chat interface, one with a human primary care provider and one with Amy. The patient actors didn't know if they were chatting with Amy or a human. Transcripts from 159 encounters were scored on 32 clinician-centered and 26 patient-centered criteria that covered clinical reasoning and empathy. Amy outperformed physicians on nearly all clinician and patient criteria, including diagnosis, management, and empathy. So uh, yeah, it is a little bit frightening uh, that AI is coming so quickly, but I think this is just another reminder that we are all going to have to start adapting to this. So the real big difference is going to be the North Star that they talk about, which is randomized controlled trials that measure whether LLM-enabled tools improve real patient outcomes, and such trials are underway. So once that really comes out, that's going to be kind of the big game changer. Could sodium supplementation benefit patients with acute decompensated heart failure? If you happen to watch my video on hypertonic saline for heart failure, you will see that I just recently talked about this. And again, as I mentioned, it is starting to gain traction. So this was a meta-analysis of 16 studies, 14 randomized and two non-randomized. So this is very, very high quality, basically the highest level of quality of evidence that we can get, and was in 3,500 patients. And compared with loop diuretics alone, sodium supplementation plus loop diuretics led to significantly more weight loss, a mean of 2.5 kilograms, and a shorter hospital length of stay, mean 2.7 days, as well as substantial improvements in laboratory parameters such as serum creatinine and NT pro BNP. Readmissions and 30-day mortality were similar between groups, and no adverse outcomes were noted, including no episodes of worsening pulmonary edema. So again, like I said, I would not be surprised in the next few years if hypertonic saline starts to make its way into some guidelines for the treatment of acute decompensated heart failure. And that's just absolutely mind-blowing because of our prior decades worth of experience saying that sodium was so bad, sodium was so bad, we got to restrict all the sodium possible. This is definitely very game-changing. Next one is ultrasound for lumbar punctures. And this is particularly interesting for me because our hospital is going to start a hospital medicine proceduralist group, which I am hoping to join. And, you know, I like doing procedures and I like improving my efficacy with procedures, if you've seen my previous videos on all of these. And so you, learning to use ultrasound to improve the success of bedside lum lumbar punctures is something I'm very interested in. And uh, basically, they found that the success rate with traditional landmark guided technique was 73%. But with ultrasound assisted paramedian technique, this increased to 85%. So definitely looking forward to this and getting some training on ultrasound use in lumbar punctures. For all my ICU friends here, uh, automated ventilator weaning in the ICU? Do algorithms outperform clinicians? And this is, again, kind of going on to that automated uh, AI kind of driven talk that we were just talking about earlier. But, um, you know, I did remember learning about and talking about this ventilator mode called PRVC, which was a mode that kind of would start reducing the support for a patient as they started taking bigger and bigger breaths on their own. So as the patient was getting stronger, the uh, machine would automatically provide less and less support. It was kind of a self-weaning mode uh, in that sense. And so I always thought that was like very smart because it's constantly analyzing what the patient is doing and then constantly being able to adjust, which basically allows the patient to start working their diaphragm and just kind of getting stronger earlier. I think one of the concerns is that modes like that were not fully optimized at that time. And so sometimes it could leave patients a little bit undersupported, causing them to tire out a little bit. But you know, as things progress, uh, of course, these algorithms are just going to keep getting better and better. So uh, this article states that ventilator weaning takes significant ICU resources, time and attention. 
Protocols help, but adherence varies. Closed loop algorithmic ventilator modes offer consistent minute to minute adjustments that might speed liberation from the vent and cut complications. This was again a meta analysis uh, comparing outcomes of automated versus usual care vent weaning among 5,000 ICU patients in 62 randomized trials. So, very high quality level of evidence. So, automated weaning modalities resulted in these significant outcome improvements in adults a shorter mean duration of mechanical ventilation, 1.7 fewer days, shorter ICU stay, 1.6 days, and hospital length of stay, two days, and lower rates of intubation with a number needed to treat of 27 and lower rates of tracheostomy, a number needed to treat of 20. Mortality was similar between both groups. So I think this is very, very exciting. And uh, those are some really, really striking numbers on some very, very high quality evidence. So definitely this is gonna be making its way into clinical practice soon. I found this one interesting. So a new discovery about lithium and the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. So they state that lithium depletion might play a role in developing Alzheimer's disease and lithium repletion might improve cognition. This is kind of interesting to me because you know how we use lithium for bipolar patients. I wonder if there is some kind of process that is similar in Alzheimer's disease disease that responds to that lithium and almost, you know, how Alzheimer's patients start to get behavioral disturbances. Is it almost like a kind of mania kind of uh, disorder that they're experiencing in the context of their Alzheimer's disease? So just to review, amyloid beta and tau are central to the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease, yet the factors that lead to the buildup of amyloid beta and tau in the brains of most people with AD remain unclear. These researchers first examined levels of multiple heavy metals in a post-mortem study of brains from older people who had participated in studies for Alzheimer's dementia, and they were found to have low concentrations of lithium in the prefrontal cortex. No other abnormal concentrations of heavy metals were found in any group. They then turned to mouse models and restricted dietary lithium in wild-type mice and two mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. The mice all developed the following key features of Alzheimer's disease. So markedly increased deposits of alpha, beta, and tau in the cortex and hippocampus, pro-inflammatory activation of microglia, loss of myelin axons and synapses, and accelerated cognitive decline. Additionally, amyloid beta bound and sequestered most lithium salts, which augmented depletion of lithium levels in the brain. However, one lithium salt, lithium orotate, showed levels of low alpha uh, amyloid beta binding. When that lithium salt was administered in the diet of Alzheimer's disease prone mice and normally aging mice, it almost completely prevented pathologic Alzheimer's-like changes in memory loss. So this is just like super exciting, uh, kind of science fiction kind of stuff to me, like just finding that lithium might have such a big role in the pathogenesis of uh, Alzheimer's disease. This definitely also seems like it has the potential to be make a big change in how we manage it. I kind of like this one. So are antidepressants associated with severe hyponatremia? Of course, we know that SSRIs have that potential of causing SIADH and causing hyponatremia. But the one thing that I took away from this uh, little report right here is that most likely uh, SIDH is going to occur in the first three months after drug initiation. Risk subsequently diminished. So uh, after a year after drug initiation, there wasn't a higher risk at that point of developing hyponatremia. So that was interesting for me to learn. And then one last for fun one. So when does the immune response to an infection begin? This one was really fun. So they basically put these people in this virtual reality simulator and when they showed them healthy people and then sick people like walking past them, they measured the study participants brain activity with EEG, MRI, and also with blood tests and found that when a sick avatar approached a VR wearer, uh, a characteristic pattern of brain activation began in the frontal parietal region. This activation triggered a cascade of neuroimmune mediators, catecholamines and eicosanoids, orchestrated by the HPA axis, followed by activation of various innate immune cells similar to stimulation that is seen following immunization. So this interesting report suggests that the perceived threat of becoming infected causes our brains to prime our immune system to prepare for an invading microbe, even before a microbe has entered the body. The mind-body connection is real, and future research will determine how to exploit it for therapeutic purposes. So just a really fun and interesting study that I thought was a great one to kind of close off today's session with. So I hope you guys enjoyed going through this recent literature. There's actually quite a bit of impactful literature that came out this month. And I'm actually hoping to go back through some of the previous months that I skipped in order to pick out some interesting articles as well. So I hope you guys will join me in those videos as well. But until then, good luck and have fun.